Now, good day to you, morning, afternoon, evening, or middle of the night. Uh, welcome to Friendship Not Live. Uh, this is Friendship Recorded, uh, our combined ABF. We'll get that straightened out there. I'm not as tall as I'd like to be. <laughs> I'm still growing and changing, though. Uh, if I'm growing there. Um, good to at least be seen by you. I can't see you that are watching, but good to be seen by you. Uh, this is part three of a study we're doing uh, together called How Do We Change and Grow? Um, this uh, study has uh, what I would call sort of a counseling uh, flavor. I hope to equip you to better help people around you to change and to grow as God would have them to be. Uh, and yet I am sure uh, as, as I teach this and study it myself and it's true of me, uh, I'm sure that uh, as we look at these issues and uh, understand from God's word uh, how we change, how we grow and are transformed according to what the Bible says, that you are also uh, being challenged in your own life with the, the challenges and struggles that you have. And so um, I'll, I'll introduce things today this way. Uh, this recording was made uh, in mid-April of 2020. Um, if you're watching this, you know, soon after I record this, uh, around April 19th of 2020, uh, you know that we are in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic and the coronavirus really world, if you will. As I've talked to people um, about how they're doing and, and just ask the question, how are you? Uh, here are some words and some thoughts that I'm hearing from people repeatedly. The word anxious, I'm anxious. Um, in my news feed every day, secular news feed that I look at in the morning daily, uh, every day, uh, not a day goes by where you see an article, a secular article, how to deal with anxiety, anxiety in the coronavirus world. Anxious. Another word, depressed. People are lonely. They aren't around people as much that at times pull us out of our emotional doldrums. And so we are uh, at times depressed. The word temptation. I hear this uh, relatively often, more time than usual, uh, a little bit bored. I'm a little more alone than usual. And so therefore there are temptations in my life of things that I know I shouldn't do, but yet uh, they're there. And then fear, afraid. When will this end? When will life get back to normal? What is normal going to look like? And what does that mean to me? Fear. Guys, if you're a believer, you know the Bible at all. You know the Bible talks about, God talks about in his word, a life of peace, a life of victory, of overcoming sin, of overcoming temptation. Isaiah talks about a, uh, a perfect peace, the person whose mind is, is stayed on God, even in times of challenge and times of uncertainty. And so what I want to ask today in this study as we continue to build on what we've already talked about, how do we look at these struggles and these challenges? How do we fight these temptations? For that matter, should we fight these temptations? And if we should, what are the battle lines? What are our resources? What are uh, the tools we have to fight? And how should we approach these things that I know uh, are not God's plan for my life? Today, what I'd like to do is to wrestle through some of these real live issues that so many of, of us and you are working through every day. And let me just clarify, when I say the word wrestle, I do mean wrestle. Uh, I promise you, this will not be a, you know, a preacher style hammer on you, imposing guilt on you for trying to work through these emotions and feelings and struggles that I just described and surely some others that I didn't. This will, I trust, be a thoughtful look at real life, a look in the context of our time right now. 
not some theological pie in the sky life, but real life when life is not normal life, real life when life right now is especially hard. Okay. Uh, by the way, if you're uh, following along here and would like access to the PowerPoint or the accompanying handout in the comment section of this video on YouTube, you will find those resources. Some of these uh, PowerPoint points may not be uh, visible because of my uh, picture there in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, but want to let you know about that. If you missed something in the PowerPoint, feel free to download and access uh, those resources that are there. All right. Uh, a quick recap of where we have been. The lesson, uh, the first lesson, we hit three main biblical truths. Number one, you have been changed, but you are to be changing and you are to be growing until you see Jesus Christ one day in glory. Until you're in his presence made perfect, you as a believer are to be changing and growing. None of us are done. Please note that. I know many of you at times use language like, yes, I've just been this way for a long time. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. And, and these, those things are not biblical. And for your own benefit and freedom and good and victory, they aren't biblical. You have been changed, but you are to be changing and growing until you see Jesus Christ one day. Number two, understand, again, back to the wrestling aspect, understand that we, that you and I as human beings, can be complex. We are not always simple beings. We'll discuss more of this today in our lesson. We are not simple. We can be complex. And then number three, uh, big, big biblical truth we documented a couple weeks ago. Understand that ultimately change and growth takes place in the heart. Lasting, um, ultimate Real transforming change and growth takes place in the heart. I'll give you this statement here that I, I've given a couple of times in each lesson. I think it's very important to understand and digest this statement. Here it is. You do what you do. And you say what you say. Because your heart, okay, believes what it believes. And because your heart worships and bow da bows down to what it worships. Again, please think on that thought. You and I uh, do and act the way we do because of our heart. It is all sourced in our heart. And so the question we're looking at here is this. Is the Bible sufficient? Is the Bible sufficient? We answered that question uh, last time partially. The answer to the question simply is yes. The Bible clearly says in multiple places that the Bible is sufficient. All right. Second Timothy three, second Peter one, Psalm 19. We all looked at those in lesson two. All agree the Bible is sufficient. Again, second Peter one says that God has given to us all things, all things that pertain to life and godliness. And so today we're going to continue this, this walk, this journey, if you will, by asking these questions. In what way is the Bible sufficient? How do we use the Bible as a sufficient resource for our needs and our lives? Essentially, what do we mean by that? What do we mean by that? Um, the Bible is sufficient. For what? It is sufficient to do what? And to understand that term, that thought, is essential to understanding why you and I do what you and I do and say and so forth. Uh, turn in your Bibles, if you would, to 2 Corinthians 12. This will help you to see these. I'll have these on the PowerPoint as well. But if you have a phone, a device, or a Bible, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to introduce um, our lesson today with uh, sort of a grid, a paradigm, if you will. Uh, again, human beings, you and me, are not always simple beings. We are complex. And again, there are dozens upon dozens of factors that go into who we are and why we do what we do. There's a book called Crosstalk by a guy named Michael Emlett. Michael Emlett wrote a book called Crosstalk. I read this book as a part of my 
uh, doctoral studies. And in his book, Michael Hamlet presents uh, a paradigm that I think is helpful. It's a set of glasses through which to see life and to understand ourselves. And so I'll introduce this and then develop this through the scriptures here. But uh, he suggests that, that each born again believer is living with a threefold identity. A threefold identity. Number one, the first aspect of our identity is that of saints. And I'll give these to you first, then we'll elaborate on them. Saints. Number two, we have an identity of sufferer. Sufferer. And then finally, we have woven into our identity that of a sinner. Of a sinner. Okay? And so defining these terms, first of all, as a saint, who am I in Christ? What has God done in my life? What has God, God done to me, honestly, in me, through me, in transforming me that affects my life today? If you are a born-again believer, back to truth one, lesson one, God has already changed you. God is changing you, and will do that, Philippians 1, 6, until the day of Jesus Christ. You are a saint with a, uh, the Holy Spirit inside of you, a new nature, you are risen again with Christ, and, and you are a saint. But secondly, we are sufferers. Sufferer means that there are things in our lives that affect us that are outside of our control. They are things that happen to us. James 1-2 describes uh, trials. He says that uh, to count it joy when... My brethren, you fall out of your control, fall into various trials. And so we are uh, sufferers. And then number three, we are sinners. This would involve things that are not as they should be, but things that are in our control. Even as believers who are born again, we have within us a sin nature. And that sin nature, friend, does affect even you as a believer way more than you probably and I probably ever realize and understand. So a couple of observations here, just some thoughts connected to this paradigm, this grid. First, listen, your sin nature is very, very real. Understand that. Um, your sin nature affects everything about you. I'll say this to you as far as looking at struggles and evaluating how we operate through things. I don't think, in fact, I, I know that I wouldn't ever look at a struggle I have with things in my life not being the way they should be as far as God is concerned. And immediately without a great deal of thought and soul searching say, that is not sin. That is in no way rooted in my sin nature. That is entirely in the realm of sufferer, things that have happened to me outside of my control. I would not say without a lot of soul searching that a struggle that I am dealing with and that you're dealing with is totally out of your control and that is not sin. Now, friend, again, I, I'm going to I want to be real life here. I want to wrestle with you through these things. Maybe it's not. OK, in some cases, maybe it isn't. But I'm just telling you, even if if somebody with, with letters by their name told me that struggle you had is completely out of your control, I would I would struggle long and hard and get a lot of counsel and a lot of prayer and wrestle with God before ever uh, dismissing that as strictly suffering. OK, hope that makes sense. I'll, I'll circle back around on all of this, but I'm introducing these thoughts here. Let's be honest, thought number two, really, discerning a struggle in our lives and whether this is in the realm of sufferer outside of my control and sinner within my control with God's help can be changed, is a battle I should take on, can be blurry. Discerning where that this struggle fits between realms two and three can be blurry. And how much each realm comes into play. But I would say to you, number three, discerning the difference is key to understanding ourselves, our struggles, and where the sufficiency of Scripture fits in 
to our lives. Let me ask this question, and then we'll, we'll, we'll elaborate this. In each of these three realms, let's ask the question, is the Bible sufficient? In each realm. Number one, as a saint, is the Bible sufficient? Well, resoundingly, the answer to this is yes. Again, 2 Peter 1, 3, God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. The pieces of the puzzle are all there. I'll go to number three. As a sinner, is the Bible sufficient? Again, the answer is resoundingly yes. If my battle is with my sin nature, the result of my sin nature, the Bible teaches God has given me victory. He can change me and he can free me from that on a daily, minute-by-minute minute basis of walking with him. Number three, or number two on, on the PowerPoint here, what about as a sufferer? Is the Bible sufficient? And this is where it gets a little more uh, important to dissect this accurately. As a sufferer, is the Bible sufficient? The answer is yes and no. You say, what? Let me explain, all right? Is the Bible sufficient to relieve my suffering? I'll give you an example. A person has cancer. They're battling with cancer, which is ravaging their body. Is the Bible sufficient for that cancer battler? Well, the answer is yes. The Bible is sufficient to help them in that situation, to help them in this uh, disease that is out of their control that God has allowed. Again, back to James 1, 2. But friend, the Bible is not sufficient to relieve our suffering all the time. That is not the purpose of the Bible. Does that make sense, I hope? Okay. Again, as a sufferer, the Bible is sufficient to help us honor God and be spiritually whole and of peace in the midst of difficult times. But as a sufferer, the Bible is not sufficient. By the way, God is. If God wanted to heal or relieve that suffering, he could do so any moment. But the Bible is not a magic book that you recite and gain faith, and then you are now free from that suffering in your life. hope that makes sense. And so to summarize here, as a saint, the Bible is sufficient. As a sinner, the Bible is sufficient. As a sufferer, the Bible is sufficient but in a little different way, all right? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And this is a passage that uh, if you know the Bible very well, it will look familiar to you. Um, but I think you'll see in this passage how the Bible and how God is sufficient and, and what the boundaries are, if you will, to the sufficiency of the Bible in our lives. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and I'll put these on the screen for you here. Verse number 7. It says this, Paul writes, and by the way, the Apostle Paul, if you know the Bible very well, may, may have been the greatest Christian to ever walk the face of this earth. He was not some casual uh, believer. He was a committed uh, servant of God, slave of God, uh, and this is his journey with uh, something he's dealing with in his life. Verse 7, and lest I should be exalted above measure... Through the abundance of the revelations, listen to this phrase, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, to make life hard for me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Okay, so the thorn in his flesh, likely something physical, that was bothering him, that was making life harder for him, and something that, frankly, as we see in this passage, Paul wanted to be relieved from. And so here's a question, which in this passage, which of these three aspects of Paul and his being and his identity is being highlighted in this verse? Saint, sinner, or sufferer? Well, obviously, uh, this is discussing his identity as a sufferer. This is something out of his control something that is a thorn in his flesh that is making life 
hard for him. By the way, plug in for you anything you want. It could be coronavirus. It could be a financial struggle. It could be um, something physical with your health. It could be a, a number of things. But you fit in this passage as a sufferer. To further highlight verse 8, he says, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, three times, that it might depart from me. I, I suspect Paul didn't just like offer three, you know, one sentence prayers. He may have fasted and prayed for a couple of days three times because this was bothering him. It was making life harder for him. It was making ministry harder for him. And so Paul asked God three times, God, please relieve me of this suffering in my life, this thorn in my flesh. And so question for you, as Paul dealt with whatever this thorn in his flesh was that he was dealing with, this thing that he asked the Lord to take away from him three times, here's the question, was God's word sufficient? Was God's word sufficient? Well, verse 9 answers this question on both ends and actually uses the word sufficient. Verse 9, Paul writes, and he said to me, God said to Paul, my grace is what? Is sufficient for thee, for you. My grace is sufficient. It is enough for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, Paul's response, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And so question, was God's grace, was God's word sufficient for Paul as a sufferer in uh, his identity in this situation? Again, the answer is yes and no. Frankly, God's word was not sufficient to relieve his suffering. That is not the purpose of the Bible. But God's word and God's grace were sufficient for Paul to live with and work through and minister and honor and please and know God in the midst of of his suffering. Make sense? Verse 10, finishing the passage off, he says, Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities because of this, and reproaches and necessities, persecutions, distresses, a number of things that we can identify with, right? For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. So review to make sure you're understanding this. As we look at these three aspects of who we are, is God's word sufficient? As a saint, yes. As a sinner, how you respond to trials in your lives with grace or with ugliness or maybe both. Folks, as a sinner, God's word is sufficient in our spirits and how we respond to uh, life as God allows it. Number three, as a saint, as a sufferer, I'm sorry, the Bible is not intended to be sufficient to relieve our suffering all the time. But the Bible is sufficient for us to respond to that suffering as long as God allows it in our lives. And so, friend, transitioning here, here's the big question. Here is the million-dollar question looking through the, the lens of that grid. As you and I look at certain struggles in our lives, are these struggles we're dealing with, we're fighting with, are they in the sinner realm or are they in the sufferer realm or could it be a combination of both? And what does that mean as far as the sufficiency of scripture in our lives? I'm going to give you two examples today that I think will help us to see how this operates and how we do things. Number one, uh, for some, is going to be much more clear-cut. What about homosexuality? Homosexuality. Saint, sinner, realm, sufferer, realm. I mean, folks, this really is at the heart of this, this issue. We're not going to get into this a whole lot today, but this question is the heart. This defines the issue. The world says, and again, they would not use the word suffer, but they would say that 
being a homosexual, being gay is out of my control. I was born this way. This is who I am. There's no reason to fight it as a sinner. It's not a sin. It is the way I am. And so why fight? Just embrace it. It is something that was done to me. And so I'm going to just live out who I am and my identity. Now, I would say to you that biblically speaking, that is hard to defend. The Bible is clear that homosexuality is not a God-honoring lifestyle. It is the result of sin, and it is a sin struggle. So homosexuality, is it in the realm of sinner or sufferer? Well, again, before answering this too quickly, I would say that there, there is some validity to the sufferer realm. Folks, being honest, again, we're wrestling here. We're not just hammering broad brushing. OK, um, in, 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 in this realm of life, in our sexuality, um, there are there have been studies done that show that there are factors in a person's life that would cause a person to be more tempted, to be more inclined to the homosexual lifestyle than others. I'm not going to get into what they are, but I do believe that even genetically and maybe even upbringing would cause a person to be more inclined to deal with the temptation to homosexuality than others. That being said, biblically speaking, without getting into it right now, um, the Bible calls homosexuality a sin. It is a temptation to resist and to fight. And as God transforms a person, he will transform them from that lifestyle into uh, the plan for which God intended them. And so what I'm saying here is this, the homosexual lifestyle is not, biblically speaking, as the word of God teaches, in the sufferer realm only, as the world would say. It is partially impacted by that, but I would say overall, the majority of that issue falls into sinner realm. It is something that is within our control. It is something we are to fight with God's that is a little bit of a simpler case study, I would think. Let me give you this one here. What about anxiety? What about anxiety? Um, not to make light, okay, but it, it seems like this is a common one. Everyone today seems to have anxiety. Um, is anxiety in the sinner realm? Is anxiety in the sufferer realm? Now, this is the point of the lesson where I would normally stop and, and allow for some discussion uh, for you to process that question a little bit. Is anxiety sinner realm, sufferer realm, combination of the two, and what does that mean? Let me just kind of frame this, this struggle a little bit. Anxiety, okay, and then we'll plug in the word with it. Listen, does Bob D'Angelo suffer from anxiety? Yes. Absolutely. Um, here are some cases where I deal with anxiety. And it's not fun, by the way. When I'm running late, <laughs> I am anxious. My heart is racing. My mind is racing. I'm not thinking straight. And I suffer from anxiety. I'll say suffer. All right. When I am not prepared for something, an event, a teaching class or whatever, I get anxious. When I'm ready, I relax. But when I'm not ready and things are coming and I'm not prepared, I get anxious. Roller coasters. <laughs> I like roller coasters. Uh, but there is a limit for me as far as height and that near, that drop all the way down, which I don't like. My one fear in life uh, that causes me anxiety is I went to uh, uh, Carowinds back in um, uh, October with the teens. As I looked at the Intimidator, my heart beat and I got anxious. I'll give you this scenario. Whenever I am on a plane entering a foreign country as a missions team leader or otherwise, something inside of me or something comes over me that causes me just a little bit of terror, as in, I don't know these people. I don't know the language, the culture, my way around. This is totally uncomfortable. And you know what? That anxiety that I experienced there, I love it. <laughs> I thoroughly enjoy, what do you call it? The high. That's probably a bad word. That's a drug word, isn't it? Please, please erase that from the video, okay? 
I, I enjoy the the rush. That's the word I'm looking for. The rush that comes with uh, something like that. You know, here's one. I, I coach soccer. Listen, before every game I coach, I get these butterflies in my stomach. I have anxiety, and you know what? I absolutely uh, I love it. I thoroughly enjoy it. What am I saying? Anxiety can be good, okay? It can cause you to flee a dangerous situation. It can make you study really hard for a test because you want to do well. Anxiety can be the result of pushing yourself, of leaving your comfort zone, which is good. My son, who loves anxiety, (laughs) uh, he has a shirt. And the shirt has two words. The two words are seek discomfort. You could even say seek anxiety. Put yourself in positions outside of your comfort level to push yourself to be more and grow beyond what you are. Now, let let me just come back to to earth here a little bit. Um, Anxiety that is out of our control is not good. When anxiety causes us not to be able to function, uh, that would be a negative. And and again, some of you live with anxiety. Uh, Panic attacks are Again, if, that, if that's something you deal with, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 certainly applies. There is no temptation, but such as is common to man, all right? Uh, you are surrounded by other folks that battle the same thing. So I don't make light here, okay? Anxiety is a problem. It is a struggle that people experience. People that I know well um, and have talked to in depth about this experience, Okay. Let me ask this question, and again, this gets into a little bit of controversy for some. Is anxiety ever beyond our control? Can we ever put anxiety strictly and clearly into the sufferer realm? Well, I'll give you a story here from my my own life. Um, And here's how it went. I I was, uh, it was the year 2009. And long story short, I had said yes to too many things, overcommitted myself horribly. Uh, For the first time in my life, began to experience uh, chest pains, uh, babblings. My heart was racing. Uh, It was thumping beyond my control. Um, And I couldn't stop it. I would try to. I would try to do things that would settle it down. But overall, it was just out of control. Uh, And so one day I ended up, uh, it got so bad, I had not told Kelly, but I ended up uh, in the ER in an ambulance because I thought I was having a heart attack. Um, Again, long story short, they tested my heart. My heart was fine. It was healthy. The doctor just said, you know, slow down a little bit. Tell that church of yours to stop sending you all over the place and asking to do too many things. And and, and yourself say no once in a while to people uh, and, and settle down. I think your heart will return to normal. But the doctor did say one thing. He said, you know, one theory I might have, which was foreign to me, is that maybe you have acid reflux. And so he prescribed some some statin drugs for me to take just in case that was my problem leading to my my heart palpitations. I took these pills for a few days and within days, my palpitations got worse. My anxiety got worse. I couldn't think straight. Um, my mood was going up and down like crit, like, which is not me at all. I'm not a moody person naturally. And so, you know, I'm sitting here and I remember one day being upstairs in my, in my room and I came down and talked to Kelly and Kelly asked me a question and I literally fell apart. It was not a hard question, but I literally emotionally fell apart and said, babe, I can't handle this right now. I went back upstairs and I'm sitting here saying, what is going on with me? Why am I so jumpy? Why am I so not able to handle anything? Well, got on the internet, thankfully, and realized that that some of the side effects of these drugs that I was I was taking, the doctor had prescribed for something that wasn't even a problem for me, were things like heart palpitations, like anxiety, like you can't think straight, like suicidal thoughts, and, and the list went on and on. And, and testimonials of people saying, when will this nightmare ever ever end? And so what am I saying to you? In that scenario, that anxiety was sort of out of my control beyond just, as I did, stop taking those medications, which were causing something, I guess you'd call it chemical, to take place 
in my mind and heart. And so, again, I'm trying to be real here, friend. Okay, the Bible is sufficient. Is a struggle like anxiety, and you fill in the, the blank. Is it strictly saint and sinner, or is it at times in the sufferer realm? I would say certainly that these things would be a combination of the three. All right. Listen, the Bible does say, be anxious for nothing. The Bible says that, Philippians 4, 6. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And if you will do that, God will work. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep it, will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. And so I'm trying to paint this accurately so we understand ourselves. If you're battling anxiety or depression or anger or lust or temptation or uh, fill in the blank, the multiple many things that we deal with, is that struggle, is it good? Is it to be embraced in some cases, honestly? Is it the result of sin where I need to grow and change? Is it the result of suffering out of my control that I, like Paul, need to ask grace, a God for grace to handle and then live with? Or a combination of all three. Again, friend, I do think personality bents, genetic dispositions, um, our life, our lives, our circumstances. Right now is a great example, not a great example, but a prime example. This worldwide pandemic that has changed all of our lives. And all of these things, personalities come into play and make some of us more prone to certain struggles than others sufferer ignited into realm of sinner. You know, again, I've got three kids. One of my kids is much more prone to anxiety because of her uh, desire for perfection. One of my kids is not anxious at all. And maybe should be a little more anxious at times. That would be sufferer realm, our disposition. But then we should take those things on and look at the sinner aspect because both of those characteristics can be positives and negatives okay again with the suffering realm at times we should look at our own lifestyle our own uh, uh, life choices our schedule has our have our choices put us in a position where anxiety is the only way to live i I tell you folks i wonder if if pretty much 90 percent of the usa uh, I'll say battles anxiety because of choices in lifestyle that you and I make. And that's another story. But here's the point. Temptation and the end result of sin often take place when our identity as sufferer out of our control collides with our identity as sinner and a sinful bent and sin nature that is triggered. Make sense? Sinner and sufferer identities collide, and this is when temptation is ignited through us. Just review as we kind of wrap things up here. Is God's word sufficient? As a saint, yes, no doubt. As a sinner, if something is defined as a sin, nature problem. And again, back to the original point, folks, I think all of us are more affected by our sin nature than we ever realize. It affects every part of us. As a sufferer, is God's word sufficient? Yes, but in a different way, as we've defined here already. I will say this. I do think that as you and I battle through struggles and work through struggles and temptations and things in our lives that can really cause a lot of problems, I would say as a general rule with our society and the mindset, the worldview we have around us, that more things would fall into the sinner category or at least greater percentages than they do in the sufferer category. As in, I think that many of us I see us. Many of the world ascribes their condition to suffering when they should be looking at it much more closely 
as a sinner in the sinner realm. Let me give you this thought. Folks, remember, the Bible paints the Christian life as a fight. Repeatedly as a fight. The Bible paints the Christian life, our lives, as a battle, as a war. First Peter says, uh, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. Listen, Ephesians 6 um, says to arm ourselves with the entire armor of God. Question for you. When does a person put on armor? <laughs> the answer is obvious, right? We put on armor when we're preparing to fight, to battle, to fight for our lives, if you will. Remember, the Bible is called in the armor of God, the sword of the spirit. What do you use a sword for? To defend yourself, to attack enemies in your life, to fight and war and sweat and bleed and hopefully to emerge victorious. That is the Christian life. And so instead of, I would say, just accepting that this battle in my life is who I am, I would think long and hard about that, friend. I would advise you that way. Think long and hard about that. Because the Bible does say the Christian life is going to be tough. It is going to be a battle. And we are to put on the armor of God for this battle and to fight the sin nature, which I think pervades essentially every struggle you and I deal with. All right? Is God's word sufficient? It is. I hope you understand better uh, the definition of that. I'll introduce next week's study uh, in this way, because we're going to uh, look next week at, so now what do we do with the Word of God? How do we utilize, if you will, the, the Word of God in our battle against uh, sin and to please and know and honor God? We're going to go to uh, Psalm 119. If you want to look at the first couple of verses in the next week, feel free, you'll, you'll benefit from that. But uh, briefly, just to kind of introduce, Psalm 119, 1 to 8 is the beginning of the psalmist's journey to battle, to honor, and align his life with God. In Psalm 119, 1 and 2, just to summarize for you, the, the psalmist uh, observes people around him and says, boy, that person is blessed. Look at them. They, their lives are undefiled. Their lives are aligned, it, it appears to me, with the Word of God. That's really cool. And the psalmist then begins to look inward and say, boy, Lord, it would be great if my life also aligned with the word of God, just like those people. And then he finishes that first uh, section, the first eight verses with a prayer, essentially, of Lord, I would love it to see my life more aligned with the word of God. Verses 9 to 16 ask the question, he asked the question, how am I going to get there? How do I use the Bible, this sword of the Spirit, to overcome sin in my life and grow and change more to being like Christ and more free from sin? And we'll look at that again next Sunday, okay? Um, I'll finish with this illustration for you, all right? Go through those slides there. This is called a, for some of you that don't do a lot of construction work, a level, okay? What is a level used for? For. With a level, friend, we are trying to determine and align the surface we are working on to be level. Um, we use a level when that surface is leaning unevenly to one side or the other. And so what you're trying to do with a level as you lay that level across a surface is to align that little bubble to where it fits between the two lines, which, which tells us the surface is now level. Okay, here's the illustration. As we seek to be and, and really battle and fight to be spiritually healthy people, we are trying to align two things. Number one, we are trying to align what we claim to believe and, uh, and likely do believe, what the Bible says to be true and what you and I claim we have embraced as the truth. We are aligning that, the Bible, the Word of God, with our actual real-time 
thoughts and responses, our habits, our thinking, responding, speaking, and living. We are aligning the Bible with our lives and our thoughts and our actions and our responses. Friend, that is not always easy. It's not always easy. For example, again, just briefly, anger. We know that God is gracious and patient. We know we are to be reflective of God's tenderheartedness and his mercy. And yet, why doesn't my life look like that? Why does my life not align with what I know is true about God and about what I should be? Again, depression. We know God is good. We know we're forgiven, that our home is in heaven, that God is in control. We are commanded to be joyful and rejoice in the Lord always. And yet, why doesn't my life align with what I believe? Friend, those are the answers I want to give you next week in God's Word. I think Psalm 119 gives us a detailed journey uh, of how to find God's Word to be sufficient in our lives practically in real life in April and May of 2020. And so we'll continue with that next Sunday. Again, I'll finish with, with this thought. Leave with you here. You do what you do, and you say what you say, because your heart, your heart believes what it believes, and your heart worships what it worships. Friend, again, as I said last study, the pieces of the puzzle are all there for what God intends for your life, even in difficult times as a sufferer. They're all there. God's word is sufficient. God has given you all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called you to glory and virtue. God's word is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness that you might be complete and perfect, mature, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Let's have prayer and I'll let you go today. God, thank you so much for your word. Lord, our hearts groan <laughs> uh, in so many ways, as Romans 8 tells, explains, uh, tells us, Lord. Our hearts and our spirits groan as we await being made whole. Right now, we are battling with uh, sin, both uh, the effects outside of us and the nature that is inside of us, affecting everything we do, every thought, every word, every action, every motive. God, I pray for these that I can't see that are, that are viewing me right now, that you would just give them a clarity and understanding just how you've made them, their own struggles. Would they, would they have confidence as they better understand the battles they deal with uh, right now, today? God, give us victory. Would our lives truly align for, for freedom and, and peace's sake with the word of God as we battle with the things that, that, that we, we struggle with. God, help us as believers to resemble Jesus Christ. Free us from sin and from temptation and the clutches of the devil, Lord, as he looks to topple us with his uh, tricks and with his darts. Lord, give us a good day uh, the rest of this day, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, thanks for watching. I trust you've been encouraged and blessed and instructed uh, have a good rest of your day, and God bless you.